When the Stars Shone Not Upon Lunara, an Agamonia story by Mike Pohjola. On this day, the stars shone not upon Orrery Hill, a Benamite town known for its proud knights and wise stargazers. On the high point of the hill was High Eye, the greatest observatory in all of Benham. Just below High Eye was Brindle Castle, home to House Brindelian, who ruled Orrery Hill and the entire state of Glamet. In Brindle Castle's ballroom, Lunara Brindelian knelt before her father, holding her sheathed saber, her long tail flat on the stone floor. Lord Philem seemed shaken, disturbed, as he stood on the stairs slightly above Lunara. Lord Father, Lunara spoke. I have horrible news. House Brindelian was ruled by the Magus Selena Brindelian. Lunara was her third daughter. Her eldest sister was in the capital Starhaven taking care of family business and politics and sitting in the Electoral College. The middle sister, now expecting her first child, was home in Orrery Hill, researching magic and helping their mother rule. Lunara would have been interested in cosmography and magic, but as the youngest sister she was trained as a knight, Come war, she would lead the Brindelian armies. On this evening, some weeks before she knelt before her father in the ballroom, she was summoned to meet her mother in her stargazing chambers in High Eye. Lunara entered the observatory, where the cosmographers took her to her mother. The main room was filled with star charts, telescopes, and bookshelves. But the key feature were the large windows which showed the night sky. Many of the constellations were visible, as was the double spiral of the galaxy which they called the Eyes of the Night. I wonder if they call our people Night Eyes because of the galaxy, or if they call the galaxy that because of us. Her mother said, admiring the heavens, her tail turned to Lunara. I always assumed we are called Night Eyes because we love looking at the stars, replied Lunara, walking next to her mother. The cosmographers tell me it is going to be a very clear night. I intend to stay here all night looking at the eyes of the night. Be careful lest the night looks back upon you, Lunara joked. (laughs) I would welcome it. (laughs) Mother said laughing so happily her sharp teeth showed. But that is not why I have summoned you. Come, Lunara. She took Lunara to her private bedroom. On top of the luxurious bed of black Quothian silk was a large package wrapped in blue linen. It is for you. Open it. Lunara cut the strings and drew the linen off. Inside she saw a beautiful shield, not a dent or a cut on it. The borders were bronze, but the center was black, blacker than any metal she had seen. She touched it, and it was warm. It's not metal. Nay. Mother replied. It's quiver and scale. I, I had it repaired for you. Your grandmother wielded it once and her aunt before her, like the knights of our house have always carried it. Quiver and scale protects its wielder from magical attacks. Then she added ironically, And, you know, the shield protects from regular attacks. Aye, that much I know. Lunara smiled. Take it. It's yours. She thanked her mother and took the shield. It was light and warm, but not hot. Very pleasant to hold, like a part of her arm already. Lady Selena looked at Lunara for a while, smiling. Then her grey face grew more serious. There is something else. You remember Virgon Gramask? The Magus of House Gramask? That absent-minded old tomcat. I am the ruler of Runedale and one of our staunchest allies. In any case, he has suggested I marry you to his son, Bo. I've never even met him. I know. Other than that, I'm inclined to agree to the proposal. But you're right, you should meet Bo Gramask first. Which is why I have arranged a meeting for the two of you in Starhaven. You will meet him in four days at the city mansion. I would have to leave tomorrow morning. Aye. Lunara had had other plans, but it was to no avail. 
Loyalty before everything was their house motto, and she tried to live by it. But there was one thing she could do before riding out in the morning. With that in mind, she bowed before her mother and exited high eye. Mother could decide whom Lunara would marry, as she had with her elder sisters, but Mother could not decide whom she loved. She rode down the hill through the busy artisan's quarters by the Blue Fire Station and down into the workers' quarters with their unpainted wooden shacks. Leaving town, she directed her mount by the fields and into the forest. The Togrel stepped softly on the woodland path, its thick antlers occasionally ripping a dead branch from a tree. After half an hour's ride, they arrived at an old hunting cabin that saw little use these days, but it fit Lunara's needs perfectly. She got down from the Togrel's big, shaggy back and tied the animal to a tree. The light of candles and sorcerer's lanterns shone from the window. She entered without knocking and put down her shield, saber, and cape. A man was kneeling before the fireplace, trying to get a fire started. His tail moved as he puffed into the wood. His silk suit was covered in soot and ash. Why not use magic? Lunara asked Radon Highweld. He glanced at her and grinned sheepishly. I thought this would be more romantic. I certainly like the view, if that's what you mean, she said, petting his tail. He purred softly. But it's the middle of the night, and it's a bit cold in here. He started puffing on the fire again. Besides, I'm not much of a magus. You're not much of a knight, either, she teased. He got up to face Lunara. I always figured myself as more of a lover, he said. Lunara pressed herself against him, her fingers on his face, their tails gently intertwining. I think we have found your true calling, Lunara said. They fell together on the furs in front of the cold fireplace, removing garments from each other slowly at first, and then ripping the last ones off when they could no longer bear the anticipation. The stars shone upon the cabin that night. Afterwards, Lunara leaned naked against the fireplace, chopped a few sticks, and lit them with a candle. Soon she had a fire going. I wanted to let you do it so you can show off, Raiden joked. Much appreciated. They sat in silence for a while, looking each other in the eye, listening to the sound of the fire and the occasional low yowl of the togrel outside. Listen, said Lunara. Remember how I was supposed to ask my mother for a permission to marry you? I have a vague recollection. He grinned. Oh, heaven, did he think this was good news? Well, it's too late now. She wants to marry me to a Gramask. Did you tell her nay? I promised to meet the boy. Can you refuse? I do not know. But this thing between you and me, do you honestly think your mother would even have given her son to her worst enemy? This thing? He said, angry now. You mean our love? I care not what our families think. I love you. And I know you love me. I... I do love you, Raiden. But if you care not, why have you not proposed? He couldn't find a good answer. His bravado disappeared like the stars at dawn. Are you telling me it is over? I must be loyal to my family. She let that sink in. If I marry Bo Gramask, I can no longer see you. So... I'd say we have to make love as often as possible before then. Otherwise, I can't take it. His hurt feelings overshadowed his desire, but not for long. Returning from the hunting cabin the next morning, Lunara met her squire, Gianna Madark, at the Blue Fire Station. She gave the reins of the Togrel to Gianna, who walked the animal to a stable. As nobles, they rode Blue Fire in first class for free. Lunara took the shield from her back and put it next to her on the bench. The Agura powered engines glowed blue and hummed a pleasant, low sound. The monorail whizzed out of the town, past forests, rivers, out of the state of Glamet, and to Starhaven the capital of the Republic of Benham. The Blue Fire monorail had been built by the ancients. 
and only had a few stations, Orrery Hill and Starhaven being among the lucky ones. Travel anywhere else took much longer. They got off the monorail. The Starhaven station was busy as always with magi, food vendors, families, street urchins, beggars, cut purses, prostitutes, Corallian pirates, Quothian silk merchants, four-armed Patangan porters, amethyst order officials, priests of the fifth eye, cosmographers, monorail drivers, police officers, and passengers of all sorts. They took a toggle drawn carriage to the Grimasque town mansion located on the Celestial Bridge, which united two continents. The house was fine, but not extravagant, made of marble and painted with pictures of the glory days of the house. A cosmographer was in the hallway to meet them. Ah, Star Lunara Brindelian, welcome to Starhaven. I'm Gishley Skifford, adjutant to Star Bogra Mask. Would you like to freshen up? Nay, thank you. Take us to Star Bow. I Star, the cosmographer said and bowed. He led them up the stairs and into a simple chamber with soft chairs and a ceiling painted to look like a particularly beautiful night sky. On a table there were wine and cakes. I shall tell Star Bow that you have arrived. Gishley Skifford said. I hope Starbo is as eager as his adjutant, Gianna quipped as the cosmographer had left. Lunara smiled wryly. When Bo comes, I want to be alone with him, she said. Of course, Star. Soon enough, Gishley Skifford arrived and said, May I introduce Star Bo Grimask? Bo Grimask was roughly her age with a fair complexion and dull eyes. Easy enough on the eyes, but would he have a spark in his soul like Raiden? Star Lunara, it is a pleasure to meet you, Bo said. And you, Starbo. I trust your journey was pleasant. It is not a very long journey. Nay, I suppose not. Spark certainly did not fly immediately. Miss Maddock, may I show you the garden? Said Gishley Skifford. Jenna agreed, and they left the potential couple alone. I have not seen you in any tourneys, Lunara said. I take it you are not a knight. Nay, I am more interested in commerce. He certainly was not interested in this conversation. Oh, that sounds very interesting. Lunara lied politely. Aye, Bo said. He then took a small bell from the table and rang it. He got up and walked to the door through which he had entered. What was this? Had Lunara walked into some sort of trap? She got up and put her hand on her saber handle. Almost immediately the door opened and in walked two big Ignisar guards, their armor bearing the insignia of House Highwell. Assassins? Nay, they were followed by an older night eye in very expensive robes. Heaven, it was Faywis Highwell, the daughter of the Supreme Archmagus and a member of the Electoral College. Thank you, Starbo, she said. You may leave us. Bo Grimask bowed to Faywis Highweld and left, without giving so much as a glance to Lunara. Faywis Highweld sat on the chair opposite Lunara and poured herself a goblet of wine. The mortal enemy of Lunara's family and the sister of her lover, alone with her and two strong Ignisars. Lunara did not sit, nor did she take her hand off her saber. Please sit, Star Lunara. Faywis said. I would rather stand. Why? So my guards won't kill you. Worry not, Star Lunara. If I wanted you dead, my assassins would have shot you full of poison arrows by now. Strange enough, but that put her slightly more at ease. Perhaps she was not in mortal peril, at least not an immediate one. She sat down and poured herself a goblet, too. How may I help you, Elector Faywis? You are a military woman, Star Lunara. So let me explain this in terms you can understand. Your family is allied to House Dengold and sends plenty of soldiers to protect the trade routes that pass through their lands. Elector Faywis, it is I who commands those soldiers, Lunara said. Clearly Faywis Highweld thought she was an idiot. Fine. You send those soldiers there. I suppose you also know that those trade routes arrive from Free City of Mosspod and that it is Benham's prime trading partner. She nodded, but in truth had not known that. Commerce did not really interest her. 
It is very honorable to protect one's allies. Faywis said, sipping wine. But... House Highworld needs those trade routes, and the Dengold ships will be sunk. As a gesture of goodwill, I wish to warn House Brindelion and advise you to keep your warships somewhere else when that happens. You know, my eldest sister takes care of politics, Lunara said. Galana Brindelion? I believe you sit next to her at the Electoral College. Aye. Spoke Faywis as if she had a sour taste in her mouth. Your sister is married to a Dengold, and unlikely to withdraw her support from her mother-in-law. Nevertheless, she speaks for our family in these matters. Yet you, Star Lunara, command the Brindelian armies, and it is precisely a military issue I wish to discuss. Nay, I think you already spoke to my sister, we're denied, and now set up this elaborate plan in order to have a secret audience with me. She could see Faywis Highweld was having trouble keeping up that smile. Clearly, she had guessed right. We could make it worth your while, Star Lunara. I could arrange a marriage between you and my brother, Raiden. I understand you two have grown, um, close. This was a tempting offer indeed. Ordinarily, the distrust between their families would have made marriage impossible between them, and this was likely to be the only chance Lunara had for spending her life with her loved one. But would she be willing to work against her own family for it? And just think, being married to the son of the Supreme Archmage, you would surely take your sister's place in the Electoral College. This was not quite as enticing, as Lunara was not interested in the political game. Clearly, whatever information Faywis' spies had delivered on her was incomplete. But it was enough to stop her from daydreaming. She would never betray her family, not for anything, not even for love. I thank you for your offer, Elector Faywis, she said politely. But I must respectfully decline. If you wish to further discuss my marriage, you should contact my mother. Lunara turned her tail and walked out of the room to the antechamber where Gianna Madark stood waiting. She was astonished to see Faywis Highweld and the Ignisaurs in the room. Star Lunara, what in heaven's happened? We will talk on the blue fire. Gianna, Lunara replied quickly. She strode away from the Gramasque mansion and towards the monorail station. It was not until they sat in their own cabin in the Blue Fire that Lunara would answer Gianna's questions. You should not have declined, Star Lunara, Gianna said. You know what they say. The High World never asks a second time. The next time something bad is going to happen, I can feel it. I will not sell my family or my honor, Gianna. Not for anything. I, Star Lara. I. They were eating lunch in the restaurant car when they heard a loud bump from the train roof. Could it have been some large bird? Suddenly, the lofty views were obscured by dark clouds which seemed to engulf the whole train. The passengers stopped eating, looking at each other in alarm. Soon the black mist entered the restaurant car itself, and no one could see anything anymore. They coughed at first, but soon noticed it was not smoke. This is not a natural darkness, Lunara said. Is there a magus in the train? asked Gianna. Their voices drowned out the panicked yells of the other passengers. Some tried to escape the restaurant car and fumbled. Others screamed for help or tried ineffectual magic remedies. Then the windows were broken, and there were sounds of people jumping into the still-moving car. The clouds slowly drifted away, revealing shadow figures pacing the restaurant and the passengers in various states of panic. Lunara hid her drawn saber behind her back. Evening, stars, said a masked night-eye man with long leather gloves wielding a saber. This is a robbery. The cosmographers and businesswomen and politicians in the car were still crying for help. No kidding, Gianna replied wryly. Lunara said in a commanding voice, In the name of the Republic, drop your weapons. The bandit leader turned, now pointing his saber at her. She took a step back and parried with her own blade. They fenced a while, and the man was good for a commoner. But Lunara had trained for this her whole life. The other bandits ran in to help but Gianna managed to trip one of them and then drew her own saber to help her mistress. 
there were more of them. Unara and her squire still had a chance to win. Leave your valuables and we may let you keep your lives, the lead robber said, still countering Unara's strikes. You chose the wrong victims, Unara replied. Whatever magic you use to conjure up the mist, why don't you use it to get yourself off the train? Otherwise, I might get annoyed. Oh, she might get annoyed. The robber yelled to his comrades and laughed. Well, I'll be. What are you, a magus? You don't look like a magus. You understand many of us are nobility. Our families will not like this. Oh, we wouldn't be robbing no common folk. It's you lot we have a problem with. We're not going to bother the ordinary passengers. Only you people eating your fancy food in this fancy car. Lunara had paid into the man's arrogance, and sure enough, it gave her just enough edge that she could make him walk backwards against an upturned chair. He lost his balance and fell down on his back. Ah! Lunara stepped on his weapon and pointed her blade at his throat. I told you to leave, she said. Now be prepared to lose your head and tail. At this, one of the robbers raised her hands into one of the positions Magi used. Red sparkles danced around her fingers, and she mumbled some words. Soon, a mighty wind blew the sparkles of Unara and Gianna's direction, circling around them. Gianna was frozen and bound by the sparkling red current like a magical rope. The sparkles encircled Unara's arms and legs and waist, attempting to tie her down, too. She managed to grab her shield from the chair and put it in the middle of the current. The black surface of the quivering scale sucked all the sparkles into it, like they were crimson shooting stars in the vast darkness of space. The Magus Kithia was incredulous and stepped away in fear. Lunara kicked the robber leader's saber further and pointed her weapon at the Magus. I told you, you chose the wrong victims. Other robbers ran at her, sporting flails and maces. Tables were turned, carpets bloodied and glassware smashed. But she disarmed them easily, leaving them alive. The other passengers in the restaurant car were standing against the walls, shaking in fear. Then half a dozen more attacked, but were similarly defeated. Most of them were night eyes, but not all. Nay, there were at least a Corellian, a Quothian, and two Ignisaurs in their ranks. The robber's leader blew his horn, and the robbers retreated to the other side of the car. Right, said the leader. We're leaving, but Kithia here is going to strangle your companion with those sorcerer's ropes. The sparkling ruby strings coiled from Gianna's waist towards her neck. All right. You got me. I have a full purse and a gold ring. How is that? Seems to me like that shield is your most valuable possession. Aye. But I am not willing to part with it. Are you willing to part with your companion? Lunara looked at Gianna, the young squire who was cousin to her sister Drissi's husband. She was not the smartest or the bravest squire she had seen, but she did not deserve to die in the hands of brigands. I suppose you're with the Sable Crown? She asked the masked man. Sable Crown was a group of criminals robbing nobles, cosmographers, amethyst order merchants, and priests of the Fifth Eye. The common folk apparently loved them, no matter how many times they were told not to. We're not with the Sable Crown. We are the Sable Crown, came the reply. So, which will it be? Shall we kill your companion, or will you give us that shield? The magical string around Gianna's throat tightened. She was turning pale. There was no telling if the robbers would honor the deal, but on the other hand, they had not killed anyone yet. She threw the black shield on a table that was still standing. And the rest of it. She removed her ring and purse and threw them as well. One of the robbers, a Quothian, ran to the valuables and then climbed out of the window and onto the roof. The robbers discussed something quietly with each other, perhaps if they should kill their victims anyway, but the leader made a gesture and the whispering stopped. They all climbed onto the roof. Lunara ran to the window and looked up. She saw an airship leaving soundlessly, sailing through heaven, away from the train. What in the heavens was that? Asked Gianna. The magic had released its grip from her as well. We were robbed, Gianna, told Lunara. By the sable crown. Star Lunara, I told you the High Wills never ask twice. I don't think this was their doing. You can never be too careful with them. 
Riding home from the station, Lunara was in a sour mood. She knew she would have to face her mother and tell her not only that the marriage proposal was a sham, but also that she had lost the shield. She would probably forbid her from traveling without a retinue. Celestor Betha, the cosmographer at Orrery Hill, was an elderly man with white whiskers and a limp tail. He told her mother had asked to meet her at High Eye. He was heading to the observatory himself and offered to share his palanquin with Lunara. They were greeted by some of the other cosmographers who told them Selena Brindelian was in her personal stargazing chambers on the fourth floor of High Eye. Lunara ascended the stone stairs alone and, seeing no servants or guards, knocked on the finely painted wooden door. There was no reply. Mother, it's me. I would speak with you. She said, knocking again, and waited. Was Mother even in there? She tried the handle and noticed the door was not locked. Lunara opened it. Mother's chambers included a luxurious room with big windows and a small adjoining bedchamber. The main room was meant for private gatherings, meetings, and observing the stars and planets. She could immediately see something was terribly wrong. A star chart lay tattered on the floor. Pedestals and telescopes were turned over, and next to them on the floor was her dead mother. Selena Brindelian was lying in a pool of blood, a gaping wound piercing her abdomen. The sight was horrible, and Lunara froze for a while, trying to grasp what had happened. Her mother was dead. Murdered! She should do something, anything. It was too late to save Mother. So she would have to revenge her instead. But revenge against whom? She must not cry or run away. She should take control. She was a leader. The third daughter of Selena Brindelian, and a well-respected knight. Lunara did not know how long she had stood there when commotion in the hallway snapped her back to the present moment. Celestor Betha ran past her and knelt by his deceased mistress. The body is still warm and the blood is still running, he said, having examined Lunara's mother briefly. Lady Selena was alive fifteen minutes ago. Who has been in this chamber? None, Celestor Betha, replied one of the junior cosmographers nervously. Oh, well, except for star Lunara, of course. Celestor Betha glanced at Lunara briefly an examining look in his old, golden eyes. There is something under her, said the Celestor. Carefully move the body into her bed. The cosmographers did as they were bid. When Mother's corpse was lifted, they saw what she had been lying on. It was Lunara's quiverin-scale shield, broken by Mother's magic but recognizable. How was this possible? The Celestor looked at Lunara and then at the cosmographers. Caesar, he said, his voice breaking. The weak and intellectual cosmographers looked at one another, none of them willing to be the first to lay their hands on an armed and armored knight, let alone the daughter of their lady. I realize what this must look like, Lunara said to Selasor Betha, trying to sound calm. But Lady Selena was already dead when I arrived. You would have me believe your testimony over my own eyes? I... The shield you found was stolen from me, not two days since. You must admit that does not sound very likely. I arrived here with you. Did you see it on me? You could have hidden it in your belongings. This is the scene of a battle. Someone attacked Mother with a saber, and she defended herself with magic. Did anyone hear any shouts or incantations? These stone walls are thick said Celestor Betha, pondering her words. But it is not upon me to pass judgment, Star Lunara. That duty now rests on the shoulders of your father, until your sister arrives from Starhaven. Very well. I shall present myself in front of him right away. I should very much like to accompany you when you do, the Celestor said suspiciously. Perhaps he was afraid Lunara would try to escape. You know the motto on our coat of arms. Loyalty before everything. I, I will honor those words for as long as I live. With that, she said goodbye and left. None of the cosmographers dared to try and stop her. 
Lunara ran back home to Orrery Hill as fast as she could, trying to escape the questions in her head. Were the High Welds behind this? After all, they never ask a second time. If Lunara had agreed to Feywis High Welds' proposition, would Mother still be alive? But how could the High Welds get their hands on her shield? Was it possible the Sable Crown was working in unison with them? But that made no sense. The Sable Crown was working against the noble families, and against the Highwelds in particular. Archmagus Hinwis Highweld had declared a campaign against the Sable Crown, and spared no expense in trying to root them out. But then how did her shield get from the Sable Crown to them? Or had the brigands been Highweld soldiers masked as the Sable Crown? This network of deceit and intrigue was not for her. Back in her ancestral castle on Orrery Hill, she ran up the many flights of stairs to find her father just descending from one of the towers to the ballroom. She ran up to her father, Feline Gossard Brindelian, who was still in the stairs. Lunara knelt in front of him, the way one did with their liege lady, or liege lord in this case. Lord Father, she started. I have horrible news. She had to tell her father his wife had died, and of the crime scene and then of what had happened in Starhaven and how her shield had been stolen. She could hear Celestor Baitha's slow climb to the ballroom and the wheezing of his breath behind her. Lord Father, I ask for your judgment, Lunara said. I have told you the truth of the matter, and wish you task me with finding the culprits and bringing them to justice. She looked up at her father, whose face and beard were covered in tears, He was crying so much he could hardly even speak. Then the sheer sadness of everything that had happened finally struck Lunara too, and she could feel the hair on her tail rise and tears flooding her eyes. Lunara, my daughter, father managed to say, much of what you have told me and much more of what you left unsaid I already knew through the magical means in my possession. On this day... The stars shine not upon me. Celestor Betha walked panting next to Lord Philem on the stairs, taking his place as advisor to the regent. He whispered something in her father's ear. Lord Philem let out a whimper which turned into a great grievous roar. Star Lunara Brindelian, he said. On this day, in the name of the Republic of Benham, under heaven all seeing, for the crimes of murder, treason, and matricide, I sentence you to be stripped of your title, to lose your squire, and to be banished from the state of Glamet. My lord, protested Betha. For a crime like this, she should be imprisoned and brought in front of the Archmagus and most likely lose her head and tail. Nay, father replied. The decision is mine. My lord. That is enough, father barked at the old cosmographer. Father, if you would only let me explain. Lunara protested as well. That is all you have done for the past hour. Now be gone from my eyes. You must depart Orrery Hill before sunrise tomorrow or you will be declared an outlaw. Lunara understood it broke her father's heart to judge her guilty, but he had no choice. Perhaps his mind had already been broken when he heard of Mother's murder, or perhaps the whispers of Celestor Betha had convinced him of her guilt enough for him to convict her. Nevertheless, it was useless to stay and argue. She had better leave before they take away her saber. She would not even be there for her mother's burial.
Lunara's sister Drissi and her former squire Gianna Madark helped her pack, and they said their goodbyes. Drissi was pregnant, and Lunara blessed the baby in the name of all the stars. Gianna would have to find another knight to squire for. Both of them seemed to believe her version of what had happened. Did you not say the quiver and scale shield would protect you from magic? Drissi asked after she had cried for the loss of her mother. Aye. Then how could mother destroy the shield with her magic? But that was impossible. Whoever was the murderer should have been immune to the magic. But we know it was Kivrin Scale, Gianna said, folding her shirts. Do we? Drissy asked. Do we know it was the same shield? You mean it was forgery? Asked Lunara. I, of course. Someone made a shield like mine to frame me for the murder. I told you, Star Lunara, said Gianna. I told you the High Worlds never ask twice. The sentence had been passed, but perhaps she could wait until her sister Galana arrived from Starhaven and became the Magus of the family. She could reverse the sentence, free Lunara of charges, and task her with bringing the High Worlds to justice. Nay, sister, Drissy counseled. You know Galana as well as I do. Have you ever known her to be lenient? For her, loyalty before everything never meant loyalty to us. It meant we have to be loyal to her, or else. This was true. She might well reverse the sentence, but only to declare a harsher one. Likely just the one Celestor Betha had suggested. So I will live a life of exile, Lunara rescinded. Drissy looked at her compassionately. I will write to you, she said. The mood was somber, and they packed the rest of her belongings in silence. Wait said Gianna then. What if you found the real shield? The sisters looked at the squire in unison. Think about it. It would prove your innocence. All you have to do is find the sable crown. And convince them to hand over the shield, Lunara added. Well, you can name that star when you see it. Where can I find them? Should I just walk the highways with a large pouch of gold? They say they have a secret base in the north, Drissy said. Where? Sister, we are the people they waged their rebellion against. We would literally be the last to know. Lunara Brindelian smiled grimly, put on her backpack, and bid final farewell to her sister and her squire. As the sun set and the first stars appeared on the night sky, she left her home in Orrery Hill and started her exile. Exile.